So let me start by thanking the uh, presenters for very insightful presentations. And uh, I'll focus my comments on just uh, three uh, key, key messages that I picked up, the three key takeaways. One is that uh, agriculture matters and remains an opportunity. Um, both David and Michael underscored that, uh, or found evidence that it's driven growth. Uh, at the same time, there are indications of reducing poverty. We saw this with Ethiopia and, Ala and Malawi. Um, but in Burkina, we also saw evidence of increasing poverty uh, with rising food prices, increasing, quote unquote, but basically, um, as a f following through from reduced purchasing power by the poor. Pro unfortunately, productivity remains low. That's a consistent message. There are also questions around sustainability, um, whether it's of subsidies in Malawi. Um, you have land expansion, driving agricultural expansion in Burkina Faso. Um, you have massive aid flows in Rwanda, and it's arguable that that has helped the country be able to, ach to achieve gains um, in agriculture. At the same time, uh, Murray also noted that the cocoa price collapse can actually link agriculture to political unrest. So given this uh, background, so to speak, um, the question that I have is, uh, what is the opportunity for new institutional arrangements? So for example, at the World Economic Forum, we've been supporting initiatives that promote public-private cooperation. We have one in particular in agriculture that covers some of the countries that were presented and essentially seeking to see how these arrangements um, can foster or accelerate private sector investment in agriculture, and this takes into account smallholder farmers. Um, and we've seen through these arrangements, you know, over 10 billion being committed by the private sector, um, reaching millions of farmers just in terms of impact and jobs being created. That said, um, over the last two days of the conference, we've had quite a bit about you know, balance, striking the right balance between government failure and market failure. Um, so this already questions the merits of this particular approach as a means of addressing some of the challenges that the presenters put forward. So my question to them, I promised them that I would ask them some questions, is whether we can develop effective, so measures of the effectiveness of such public-private cooperation uh, interventions that are taking place. My second comment is, uh, or takeaway was with respect to structural transformation. Um, the presenters, uh, for example, Michael noted that both the agricultural sector and non-agricultural sectors are, uh, have low productivity. In Ghana, we saw that manufacturing growth has been low, and it was noted that in, in Ethiopia, the productivity of manufacturing is low, although I spoke to David earlier and said over the last three years, we've seen tremendous growth in manufacturing in Ethiopia. Uh, but then we get into issues around, is it around Addis? Is it spread out throughout the country? So in terms of the impact on poverty, that's uh, questionable. Uh, we also had a, an observation about the role of the labor market, for example, in Kenya, uh, where you have informal sector employment growth rising, um, but also lack of clarity about what exactly is happening in that particular sector. So just to add to this, again, over the past two days, it's very clear that over the past uh, two, at least two decades, uh, probably a little bit more, Africa has been deindustrializing. And uh, at the same time, we've seen the services sector grow. So as we pursue um, reinforced or renewed enthusiasm around industrialization policies, Justin Lin was very uh, eloquent about that. Um, I have to wonder a little bit. So if I cite a few statistics from a recent report from ANCTAD, this is Economic Development in Africa report, they noted that between 2009 and 2012, the services sector in Africa grew at more than twice the average rate for the world. It accounted for one third of formal employment and 21 African countries had a source of services in output greater than 50%. Unfortunately, similar to agriculture and manufacturing, productivity in the services sector also remains low. So as we address some of the uh, bottlenecks to a takeoff in industrialization, energy being a major one, I wonder whether we can explore transformation paths that can link uh, this movement from agriculture to services and then forward to manufacturing, for example, through the use of regional and global value chains. There may be others, and that's a question to the panelists. 
The third uh, key takeaway that I had was that it's not just income to borrow from uh, Murray's own words. Uh, we saw mention of the role of political violence, social unrest in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, arguably, there's the role of post-conflict recovery in the case of Rwanda. In their case, it was positive. Um, there are non-monetary measures of poverty, for example, Madagascar with its uh, mixed performance still showing improvements in stunting, for example. In Burkina, you saw the impact of population growth rates also having an, an impact on, on both growth and arguably also on the poverty front. And there was also a, a reference to the effectiveness of public service delivery, uh, in particular with respect to health and education. I'd like to extend that uh, a little bit by looking at the impact of technology, uh, which did not come through, um, and this probably was not the, the, the objective of the work that you were doing. And one question that I often get is, uh, what is the next M-Pesa in Africa? And M-Pesa not being the only innovation, but clearly one that has had a significant impact in terms of banking the unbanked in countries like Kenya in particular, Tanzania as well. Um, less impact in, in other countries, uh, but the ability to transfer resources between the urban and rural areas um, is something that would be of interest to see what, what exactly has happened to poverty there where the income's not being generated in the rural areas but is being facilitated um, by technology. At the same time, um, if we look at the uh, impact of the MOOCs, for example, so technology in education, it's clear that technology alone is not sufficient. Uh, we need to take into account um, other factors, right? So the basics and the, and the context remain important. Uh, but a key uh, question, at least to my mind, is what amount of investment needs to be made? Because there is a school of thought that Africa does not need to invest much in technology and should just adopt or adapt technology that's been developed in other places, uh, particularly the developed world. And um, so my question, uh, my last question really is, should Africa go tech or not? Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> so speakers, you can sit up here, please. You, please, Come up here, please. Okay, time for questions. Since there are lots of countries and lots of issues, we'll have to be brief. But uh, Eric can start. Uh, a couple of uh, very quick questions. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, quick questions. Uh, first of all, the, the speakers said very little about which poverty lines they were using. Is it one, uh, one twenty-five dollar a day? Is it? Uh, uh, national poverty lines based on uh, uh, food energy intake, uh, basic needs. I'd like to know more about it. And incidentally, uh, these different uh, methodologies do not necessarily track. Um, together with Andy McKay, uh, we, uh, we compared uh, the uh, poverty estimates using both the $125 a day and national poverty line and it was far from a perfect uh, tracking. Secondly, um, the, some of the uh, uh, findings that were reported today uh, are implausible. Uh, there was one, I forget which countries, where poverty went from uh, 35 to 50 percent back to 35. Clearly, this, re this reveals uh, uh, surveys that are not comparable. So again, one has to be very careful in terms of being sure that uh, surveys are comparable. And finally, um, I, was, I was really surprised that uh, in uh, at least three of these countries, the, the data uh, that were used uh, ended up uh, 10, 15 years ago. Burkina Faso, 2003. Cameroon, 2007. Kenya, 2005. Um, can you not get some more recent data? And again, I would have thought that uh, uh, progress uh, over the last 10 years, at least in some of these countries, might have been uh, significant. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rofos uh, FEO. Uh, very interesting. Uh, 
presentations and very informative. Um, I have three points I would like to make, uh, maybe may require a bit more careful assessment. First, um, a common point was low productivity uh, in agriculture. Um, may have to be more precise what kind of productivity you look at. Uh, actually, in Africa, on average, um, land productivity grow growth has been much faster than any other region over the past 25 years. Um, and even that on, among, also among smallholder farmers. What has stayed flat is labor productivity in agriculture. So the question, what, how does that compare in each of the countries, uh, uh, which I, uh, I haven't looked at that uh, country by country, or I wouldn't have the numbers, but I think that's something to, to look into. But what's happening there, it could also be is that um, uh, the lack of labor productivity growth has to do with further fragmentation of land, except maybe in Burkina Faso, where it seems to be an expanding uh, land frontier still. So at one point, we'd like to get uh, some more reaction on what you mean by that. Second is on, on food price inflation. Uh, in the case of what Michael was presenting on Burkina Faso, it seems if food price inflation is so important that um, uh, all poor are net consumers of food, right? So it doesn't seem to have an impact on the farmers. So where does the price increases end up? In whose pockets do they end up? Maybe uh, in, in intermediaries. We may also, on, on price inflation, um, um, I didn't hear any part of the story talk about um, food subsidies, food price subsidies, which is important in most of the countries. Um, and also, if, we look at the, if you look at the global market prices, you see a lot of volatility, but that's much more muted in average domestic food prices in, in African countries. So in between, there's, among other things, there the foods. Uh, price subsidies and how does it work uh, work out? But underneath that, <clears throat> what I didn't hear because probably only use annual data is the volatility prices um, in each harvest uh, cycle. Well, what you see in a lot of problems in in the countries is that all farmers produce in the same cycle. There's no storage space, lack of access to markets. They dump all the the products that produce at the same time in the market and then it plunges and then it goes back up again. And that causes a lot of the problems for income security as well as, I guess, should have an impact on poverty. Um, final point in the comparative notes, um, maybe could highlight a bit more systematically. Um, I think one point you, you raised for the, for David raised, <clears throat> for one of the countries, but not for all of the countries, spatial differences across the countries, like Ghana, it's very different you look at the trends in northern Ghana uh, and as compared to the average of, of the country. And I think that applies to all of the countries. So maybe that uh, could be looked into further. Uh, and last but not least, um, uh, you mentioned the role for the social protection program is important to Ethiopia. It also plays a role in the other countries, but in different ways. So see how that impacts on the poverty numbers uh, would be important to, com to get to uh, the common <coughs> factors, also the difference across countries where... In some countries, these programs work better than in the other. Sorry to have taken so long. We could do another one, maybe. Okay, down there. Who on the behind you? Please. Um, thank you. Um, Susan from Macquarie University. Yeah, I have a, a concern about reconciling the results in the different countries, in particular the rural and urban poverty. We see that in some countries, uh, the rural poverty is declining. In others, it's increasing. And when we compare Uganda with Burkina Faso, we see that in Burkina Faso, growth was not poverty reducing, but it's poverty reducing in, in Uganda. Is it an issue of a threshold of the growth rate? Or it is something to do with the price of agricultural products? Because we note that in the two countries, there were no productivity increases. It was just increase in agricultural production. We see a success story for Uganda, but we don't see a success story for Burkina Faso. So probably we need to know more about the prices as well. Is it because of the price of these agricultural products, given that in both countries there wasn't an increase in productivity? Then there was an interesting uh, finding in, uh, Mari mentioned that in Madagascar, the poverty rates were lower for females than males. I think that's, un that's rare. Stunting. 
Stunting. Stunting. Sorry? Stunting. Static. Standing. Static. Static. Oh, okay. So sorry about that. I got it wrongly. And and the other issue is about um David made a comment that um uh, poverty, monetary po poverty in Ghana was uh, there was a slow response to monetary po uh, poverty to growth. I wonder why. I mean, what did you mean by, by that, that there was a slow response um, to or monetary po uh, poverty to, to growth? Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, first, uh, for Eric, um, the poverty lines that we're using in all of these uh, studies are national poverty lines, uh, basic needs uh, approaches. Um, and um, yeah, so in, a, in quite a few of the case studies, uh, we also used uh, this utility consistent approach to estimating regional poverty lines. Um, and so the, the emphasis here was on the particular case study and not trying to, to make it something that would be comparable across, uh, across countries. Um, in terms of the, uh, the volatility of the, the poverty estimates uh, that we observed in the, in the Ethiopia case, this is a, a this particular uh, data set was the Ethiopian Rural Household Survey. Um, and so the, the comparability of that, I, I would argue, is actually is quite good. It's a small sample of 1,500 households. Uh, but I think the, the point is, is really um, that our monetary poverty numbers can be so volatile. They're not capturing long-term trends uh, in poverty, but they, uh, you can see these enormous changes due to shocks such as uh, food prices and, and, and droughts. Um, um, <clears throat> just uh, a, a comment on uh, food price inflation and, and seasonal uh, and variation in, in food prices over, over time. In, in Ethiopia, what's interesting is we're finding uh, that with uh, the improved infrastructure, uh, that uh, there's less variation in, uh, in seasonal prices because of the integration of, of the markets. Um, and so that's just a comment on, on that particular uh, question um, and uh, then uh, I'm going to leave it there for now. I have to get my thoughts together. Okay, hey, also thank you very much for these uh, comments and questions. Um, I start uh, with one point raised by Elsie. You uh, asked about the uh, scope for public-private partnerships. And um, I mean, the problem specifically now in the case of Burkina is that there are many ideas around. And if you read the poverty reduction strategy papers, there's a lot on how one could increase productivity in agriculture. But then, indeed, there is a problem of, I think, one, commitment, and second, also the capacity to implement these. And so they do indeed now, I mean, the donors go more and more uh, into the direction of public-private partnerships, and maybe that can make a difference. I, I think um, that's, that's well possible, but now, again, specifically in the case of Burkina, of course, the first thing they need now is a stable government, right? Good. Um, then... I go to uh, Eric, his point. So the same Burkina, it's a national poverty line, which is a bit uh, lower than the $1 poverty line, but we tested also the robustness towards alternative lines, and the trend you saw is quite uh, robust against this. Um, we take into account regional differences in prices, so we um, have price deflators for the various regions in Burkina, so that's um, in the line. It's not a utility consistent line, so we do not apply the concept that was mentioned by David simply because we have not uh, data that would allow to do that. And they personally I also have a few reservations about this, but that maybe not for now. Um, and yeah, you mentioned the, the end line of the, the data. In fact, in our case, it's 2009, and for the DHS, 2010, for the uh, Agriculture Survey, 2010, it's just, I have more detail in 2003, and though there was one or two tables where indeed it ended in 2003, but the, the poverty trend and the story about the agriculture productivity that's covering the period until 2010, so it's relatively recent. But otherwise, I fully agree that for many African countries, that should make quite a difference whether you stop in, in 2000, um, 2000 or in 2010 or so. Good. Um, then Rob's points, um, also very valid. So regarding the productivity, in my case, that was indeed land productivity, so the yields uh, per hectare, right? 
and um, or the production per hectare of land. And yeah, the story, I mean, of course, one could think that if prices uh, rise so tremendously, so why do farmers not benefit from this? And I showed you a few numbers about the share of households that uh, sell these uh, products on the markets and also the share of the consumption that is uh, purchased on the market. And this is quite enormous. And the story is really that uh, most households are not in a position somehow to store their harvest and then somehow to play on the price. Most of them really sell what they uh, produce right uh, after the harvest and of course prices are very low and then most of the benefits go to traders. And there are some programs um, on paper that you know would allow farmers to store their products and um, to work more through associations and so on. But for the moment, that's uh, really a problem. Good. Uh, regarding the food subsidies, so that's also something that is on the agenda. It was not uh, in the earlier 2000s, but um, I mean, there was uh, first unrest in, in 2009 and then again in 2012. So in the course of these social unrest, the government has started to experiment with food subsidy programs. And s some of them have shown a little bit of success. Others were not so successful. So that's s still something that is somehow in the experimental stage. Good, and then the last point um, um, that was raised regarding the, um, the structural transformation. The first I want to make clear again, it's not that in Burkina there was no poverty reduction. There was poverty reduction. It was just very low compared to the growth they experienced. Yeah, it's not a country where you have zero poverty reduction. It's just very slow. And um, yeah, it's again to make this point. It, it's in my view, basically a story of say, a lack of structural transformation in, in connection with this high demographic growth. And of course, these two are interrelated. I mean, the demographic growth is, is endogenous to this. And I think if you want to trigger now uh, faster development and more poverty reduction, it's really that we have to work on this structural transformation and then many other things will follow, including lower demographic growth. And this will then also um, take um, a bit away the pressure from the, the agriculture prices, again, in conjunction with the increase in productivity. Thank you. Uh, just talking a little bit about the government failures and market failures uh, and linking it to your point about uh, technology, because one of the things that, that strikes one about this, uh, almost the way, the way we write about it, but pro probably the way the, the political economy pans out, is that uh, it's even even liberalization is a government driven thing and it's that does that's not innocuous it's driven from a political particular set of political circumstances and a particular set of political actors and plays out from there uh, so you know uh, th that's one of the reasons i think why one sees these these exercises where you 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 say this is a break and then you somehow drift back to to the old way of doing things, uh, the, the infrastructure investment in Cameroon is a great example that got completely distorted in a sense by the political configuration. Um, the, uh, whereas the impact, one of the great things about M-Pesa of course is, is it almost zoomed past government to, to people and capacitated people again and opened up some dynamic, uh, you know, to some extent it's not so much about uh, government failure in the market. It's about uh, whether your focus is on capacitating people or not. Um, uh, I also think you're making a really good point, though, about the need for some more theory. It's a bit of a Stiglitzian type of a point, but I think it's true. Uh, we, we need to do some thinking about these processes of structural transformation and uh, uh, to make sense of all of this. You know, the facts don't tell their own story. Um, and, it, and it's a very hard and variegated story. Um, even within, even this within group approach of ours has thrown up a lot of variation. Um, uh, all I can, all I can say to, to Eric was that the project tried to be very self-conscious about data. The, the, in fact, one of the chapters, the, the way they organized, the way the book is organized the final grouping of countries is called low information countries, which is sort of an acknowledgement that uh, in this case, it was the DRC, that we can't believe anything that's out there. 
Um, and, uh, but still, there are these anomalies. Well, uh, in, certainly in the, in the uh, Kenyan case and in the Cameroonian case, there was a lot of attempt to, valid, to tell a story that wasn't just about the headcount ratio. The headcounts or the poverty estimates made sense in the context of a story that was being told. I think that's a, a strength of the, the methodology. Um, l let me stop there. Okay, just add something. We talked about a structural change. And I think one of the things we try to do in the Kenna chapter is look at structural transformation and how it's driven by changing in factor proportions. And if you look back in Kenya over time, look for example the accumulation of capital relative to the growth of the labor force. It was going up until 1980. K over L was going up. And it sort of flattened out and even fell to some extent. Which means that there is a structural transformation going on. People are getting pushed out of the agricultural sector into the urban sector. But the formal employment, formal sector, there's not enough investment in the country. So the formal employment is growing very slowly. And people end up in the intermediate informal sector. So if you look at employment outside agriculture now, 80% is in, in non-formal or in, not in the formal sector. Which means that you shift people from the rural areas into mostly not so productive activities in the urban areas. Uh, and we try to, sort of problem with, uh, Eric has a point, we have data, survey data from 94 to 2005, 6. So it's a very short span. The next survey is coming next year, so we'll write a new paper then. But still, <laughs> if you look at this period and try to explain what's happened, I mean, there's a very modest growth in per capita incomes over this period. Uh, poverty is going up over this period. And this is driven by inequality going up quite a lot. And what is explaining inequality going up then in the case of Kenya? Well, first is the composition effect. The urban sector is weight. The weight of the urban sector is higher. The inequality, particularly in the urban sector, is increasing. And the urban rural income gap is increasing quite a lot. And if you look back in the history of Kenya, mm -hmm. as what's been driving inequality, if you have the urban rural gap, you mm -hmm. have quite a bit of the story in there. And that seems to play out even now. We don't know for sure after 2005-06. We have some DHS numbers to look at, but we don't have an income, so we say, don't say as much about that. But the structural transformation, as I said, factor accumulation, driving structural transformation, explaining what's happening. I think that's my take of things that are going on, going back to Lewis and all, of, all the rest. Okay, I think we are all hungry. Uh, if you wondered how we did the estimate of poverty in 1914, you have to read an old paper in World Development 1986. Never mind. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>